McComack, and my presentation is on CRISPR-Cas9, a pedagogical approach. The audience for this presentation is intended for educators who teach college-level biology courses. Here we have pictured uh, John Belushi from the movie Animal House as a great example of what a college student may or may not look like. The objectives for this presentation are to explain how CRISPR is used for manipulating DNA molecules, explain the techniques for exploring gene function and alteration, explain the importance of CRISPR-Cas9 DNA technology in understanding disease processes and treatments. Why is the concept of genetic engineering important? Well, biotechnology companies will account for over 727.1 billion by the year 2025. This means there's going to be huge markets in DNA sequencing, tissue engineering, health, food and agriculture, and a variety of other fields. What does CRISPR stand for? It, CRISPR stands as an acronym for Clustered, Regularly Interspaced, Short Palindromic Repeats that exists on the DNA molecule. These allow for little clusters of DNA segments that are used within bacterial immune systems. What is Cas9? Cas9 is the enzyme that works with the CRISPR system using guide RNA to target certain aspects of DNA on, on a very small level and to cut the DNA at that location. This has huge impl implications in biotechnology and it's an emerging technology as of 2014. So now five years later, CRISPR is going to be here and it's going to be here for a while. So CRISPR-Cas9 has achieved success in genetic engineering where other technologies have failed. The recombinant DNA technology field is not a new field, relatively speaking. And so CRISPR-Cas9 is pretty much the forefront of that field and allows for the technology to grow and for things to change. So remember, teacher students, that this is just one of many different types of genetic manipulation techniques. So what can CRISPR-Cas9 do? Well, it's going to be able to create new medicine make us better food, reverse aging, or stop the process of aging, so we can maybe become elves. It'll allow us to produce animals which have been extinct, so de-extinction. Ethically, it'll allow us to also design humans to be better, faster, stronger, smarter, and also have designer animals, which can have a far-ranging effects. Now I'm gonna like go ahead and go into the background of what Cas9 CRISPR technology can do. Well, CRISPR Cas9 is a genetic engineering and that's gonna change the way that genomes are edited. Cas9 is a naturally occurring phenomenon in bacteria immune systems where it wards off viruses and foreign attacks from other bacteria using plasmids. Moreover, CRISPR Cas9 is important and may even be considered the largest leap forward in genetic engineering. So remember, this has huge implications. Before we get any further, we're gonna talk about biotechnology trade secrets. So with CRISPR-Cas9 being an emerging and new technology, it's kind of like how computers were in the beginning when they first started. So there's a lot of people who want to steal industry secrets and trade secrets so they can more capitalize on this process. So we need to be aware of that. And we also need, it's similar to if Coca-Cola were to give away its secret formula to the public, that's gonna make it a little bit more difficult to understand some of the techniques that are involved with CRISPR, like the recipes that you would use to, for instance, alter a genome. There is some stuff present, but as of yet, nothing is really in the public domain. That being said, CRISPR-Cas9 is a scalpel 
rather than say a other genetic engineering techniques were more like a blacksmith. So CRISPR-Cas9 is able to cut it, the DNA up into small little bits, whereas genetic engineering things in the past were more like a hammer and tongs hitting on an anvil. Uh, it worked, but it was more crude and less effective. Some of the possible applications for CRISPR-Cas9 are gene surgery uh, and drug development. Um, new materials, uh, new types of food, um, different types of animals, maybe even uh, bioterrorism, uh, bioweapons, uh, different genetic variants that we've never seen before. All of these are now possible with CRISPR-Cas9. So there's an orders of magnitude difference in what can be done with CRISPR and other genetic engineering techniques. They've said that there's about a 5,000 times difference. So that's going to make things a lot different. Um, this, is, this is what they use in the term the physics world as orders of magnitude different. So now we're able to do much smaller gene edits than had ever done before. And this is going to allow us to, rather than destroying an organism and trying to genetically alter it, we can do individual gene edits. So if an individual does not like a certain gene in their body, they can change that, supposedly. Here's a great graphical representation of how CRISPR-Cas9 would exist in the wild. The big oval you see here is a bacterial cell. Here we have that looks like the little moon lander is a virus. Uh, the virus would inject its viral DNA into the cell, the prokaryotic cell. And then here we have these adaption molecules, which would cut the virus up. This is part of the immune system. And it would check it on this CRISPR array. And it would place it onto this CRISPR array. Here we have the repeats, which are the diamonds. Next, we can see how there's these spacers in between of the repeats. Well, we have these CRISPR RNAs, which are processed. So ultimately what's happening is, is the CRISPR-Cas9 is taking the DNA, putting it into the genome, and then cutting it out so that the virus can't replicate itself. The viral DNA would normally integrate itself into the genome of the bacteria. So this is a way to stop the viral DNA from executing, creating more viruses. Therefore, we've been able to hijack this. And I will show you soon in the next coming slides how that is possible. Here is an example of a Cas9 protein. So remember before we talked about the interspace palindromic repeats, they would bind onto the Cas9 protein here uh, on, on the, the site here. Um, of course, after the, the DNA sequence is broken open. The matching DNA sequence would go onto the RNA that's on the Cas9, and these little parts here would break apart or cleave the sugar phosphate backbone on the DNA and allow that portion to be cut out. This PAM sequence is very integral to the whole process right here. This is very integral to the whole process, um, and we will go over that in just a few seconds. So here's CRISPR in a more simplified version. This is the easiest graphic I have been able to find on just how exactly it works. So starts off here with the Cas9 protein. It forms with the guide RNA cell. So we talked about that before on the Cas9 on how that how that attaches. So it attaches directly on there. There's the guide RNA, and you can see here this PAM site there, and that is what stops it. So the Cas9 RNA complex cuts the double strand of DNA, and what that does is it allows for any programmed DNA may be cut 
and insert into the DNA. So this part right here is very important in how the whole system comes in. So normally it would just cut it and that's how it worked. It stopped at letter three or number three. That's where it would stop for the, um, the natural way. So adding this level four in here with the program DNA, that's the synthetic biology. That's where we get the genetic engineering aspect. So remember, keep your students engaged. We want to educate to the point of keeping them excited about what's being taught. Uh, and one of the ways to talk about that is to talk about the future. This isn't a dead thing. This is a new living thing. And in the future, gene modification technologies will enter into a new realm where genetic modification can be done across the living spe spectrum. Very simply, it'll be like downloading an application on your phone and just injecting a vaccine. That is the future of CRISPR-Cas9. So for any of your students that you know are interested in new medicine, maybe they're becoming medical doctors, um, think about the implication this has for their careers. Uh, biotechnology is a huge industry. It's going to be able to cure disease, cure cancer, and ultimately cure the faulty disease, which causes a lot of genetic abnormalities. Um, this is bigger than stem cells. This is bigger than than what we've been able to uh, come across. I mean, you can still use stem cell technologies within CRISPR-Cas9, and I'm sure it'll be very important to integrate both of them together. But remember that with these new technologies that emerge, we're able to do more with them. So um, really point out that, you know, the cure for cancer could be CRISPR-Cas9. One of the cool things about CRISPR-Cas9 is it's going to make us a lot bigger, better foods. Um, in the 1960s version of H.G. Wells, The Time Machine, uh, in the future, the Morlocks and the Eloy uh, were able to eat cherries that were that big. CRISPR-Cas9 could allow that to happen. We're going to be able to have more productive crops. We're going to have less chemicals, and we're going to have more, more land for farming, which ultimately means a more sustainable human population. So these are the technologies which are very important for the progress of our species. So I do a little bit of ranching. And with that, we have some cows, we got some sheep, we got some pigs, we got chickens and turkeys and all manner of things in between. So what CRISPR-Cas9 is gonna allow people to do is have designer animals. Animals that can finally serve their human masters the way nature always had intended. So we're gonna have better quality meats. We're gonna have animals that work better. For instance, a dog that has the intelligence of a pig, but still has the drive to serve its master. Um, and then also animals as weapons of war. Um, we can start creating animals that can be served for a military purpose. Uh, currently, there's dolphins and uh, horses and and uh, and all these different types of animals. Um, dogs, you know, <laughs> war dogs are used. These can now be implemented more with these Cas9 technologies to make them stronger, faster, better for our purposes. And also, uh, we can have Kobe beef that, um, you know, we could take the, the genes from the Kobe beef, um, identify the genes that, that are in the genome for that, that certain type of beef, and insert that into every single cow and have really delicious beef. Uh, could you imagine in the future uh, where you can have a chicken leg uh, the size of two turkey legs or an ostrich? Uh, these are all possible with CRISPR-Cas9. Or, for instance, um, look at the, uh, the Flintstones. You know, there was an animal for every aspect of their life. I know it's kind of comical, but... Perhaps that's even possible with CRISPR-Cas9, a pig that destroys all the wood garbage that we have. <laughs> Who'd have thought? As a hunter, I feel somewhat of a kindred spirit towards these grizzly bears here. And we shot them all here in California. They're all gone now. But using the latest genetic modification techniques, we could bring them back. Um, nothing would bring my heart more desire than to see that grizzly bear snarling at me from within a cave and being able to shoot it ethically. Um, that's what makes me get up in the morning, and I hope uh, I hope you can maybe portray that to some of your crazier students like me. One of the things also about genetic modification is altered aging. So we're going to be able to change our aspect of aging. We're going to be able to live past 120 years, have an increase in the quality of life, and ultimately contribute more to science. If you're a Star Trek fan like me, you know about the Wrath of Khan. 
Well, that's one of the implications and the ethical dilemmas which is presented by genetic modification. So remember, there's going to be huge societal implications, religious implications, and physical implications if this is not legislated properly. So that's something you can always talk about with your students too is um, what would happen if humans were made more perfect? What would that mean? How does that fit into a Christian worldview? So, you know, lab accidents in the past were, uh, this is where I stole this, this uh, slideshow uh, design from, was a, a lab accident. So I thought I'd add this, this video, this little caption in here. Uh, lab accidents in the past might end up with some singed eyebrows, loss of facial hair. Um, you know, if you're wearing the proper uh, PPE, not too much problems, but maybe in the future you're using the wrong virus or you accidentally uh, prick your finger. Uh, now, uh, this one here says, worries about genetic engineering are massively exaggerated. I can count on two tentacles the accidents we've had. So if you're anything like me, you like the movie Jurassic Park. You thought it was amazing, and that's why you got into biology. Well, remember this, whenever you're in the lab, that the most studied and available bird for both laboratory and culinary purposes and experiments is the chicken. We could take the chicken embryo and biologically nudge it in this way and that until what hatched was not a chicken, but a small dinosaur with teeth, forearms, and claws, and a tail. It can happen. So just remember that every time you're in the lab, you could be making a dinosaur. Don't forget and consider. That. Remember this, tell your students that only you are gonna be able to make dinosaurs. The end, I mean, it's a big dinosaur, what can I say? Ah! So since this is about the pedagogy of you know, how to teach college students um, and for, for them to be educators, I have a, a question here from a college student and let's see what he has to say. Go ahead. So my question is, how is a chicken relatable to the Well, it's about the genes. So they've found that uh, the Tyrannosaurus rex is much like a chicken, more so than like a reptile. So we can alter those genes to make a chicken big, uh, you know, like rather than having wings, uh, we can give it claws and forearms. We can take off the feathers or make the feathers different. Um, there's all these different things. Once we identify the certain genes which cause these, which we have available, we can alter those genes with CRISPR-Cas9, which will allow us to change a chicken into a dinosaur. Anything else? So what are your thoughts about creating a grizzly bear? I would definitely take a existing grizzly bear, say like a Kodiak bear from Canada, and I would uh, put, I would go to the museums and find DNA, uh, do a DNA analysis of old old grizzly bears that exist in California, and then splice those genes where the other genes are, and those existing grizzly bears and then breed those grizzly bears so that you would have um, pretty much a hybrid grizzly bear, but it would be bringing back the extinct grizzly bear. So one last question. So I know an agricultural business right now here in California, water seems to be one of the larger issues. Could this CRISPR help out with that produce crops that require less water? And that's exactly what I'm getting at here is CRISPR-Cas9 could not only make less water crops that require less water. They can also um, allow for the less use of fertilizers and pesticides, as well as being uh, produced more per unit area. So, uh, you know, you can have that trifecta, what farmers are always going after, the better breeds that require less water, that take less fertilizer, that just grow, that grow better. Uh, they could even be nitrogen fixers, just like beans are. Um, could you imagine corn that's, you know, that big and used for feedstock? Uh, it would just change the whole world. Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely going to help out with water issues. Uh, this might even help us, you know, be, make the desert arable land. So all these things are very important to think about. Uh, remember, always answer the questions of your students. Um, don't leave them guessing. And um, always spend that extra time to make sure they get it. Uh, do you have any questions about CRISPR-Cas9? Okay, thanks.